All right, uh, let's talk about Autocodec, which is actually maybe a good segue uh, after uh, IPVM, uh, because we're gonna talk about uh, shipping codecs in Wasm into IPFS. Uh, so self-decoding graphs, essentially. So uh, at a high level, uh, because if you can treat a Wasm blob as a black box pure function, right? Means you get, get to do all the cool stuff that we were just talking about uh, with it. So, dynamically load codecs, instantly discoverable, travels with the data, and you can signal content with these. Okay. So, yeah, I, we'll talk through all of these, don't worry. <laughs> okay, so, um, there's a couple different ways of doing this, right? So, a, a challenge that we've had, we've heard from a few other people, and even just like in the category of, from, from others in the category of like, wouldn't it be great if, is what if I didn't have to pre-deploy my codex? What if I just got some data and I knew how to translate it automatically? Hence, auto codec. Roughly, there's two ways of doing this, right? You can ship a, some kind of a blob that you can interpret and run over the IPLD, or you can write a DSL. Um, for those of you who were in the um, session talking about GraphSync a couple days ago, um, GraphSync got pretty complex. Uh, and DSLs over for complex cases often get very complex and deep and difficult to reason about. So basically, uh, even though DSLs, the nice thing about DSLs is they scope the problem down to exactly your domain, like to the point that you can eliminate entire classes of error, like just completely. Um, now people have to learn the DSL, they have to learn all these other things, right? Um, so what if we did the opposite direction? What if we went with the messy version, which is I'm gonna ship wasm blobs, which, yeah, are Turing complete. They could potentially run forever, but we can mitigate that, and let people write whatever they want in there. It's fully general, and uh, now it does literally everything we want. We never have to upgrade a DSL again, because we're literally just operating on data. So this is sometimes called worse is better. Um, there's a, a, a great uh, article from the, the early 90s about this. Um, that's basically, look, the, the thing that has momentum, the thing that's getting mind share, it might not be better today, but it will be better in 10 years. And I've talked to uh, a bunch of companies, um, you know, Shopify, um, Cloudflare, Fastly, others. Like, what's your experience with Wasm? We're thinking about turning everything into Wasm. Uh, and the resounding response is, uh, Wasm is the future. The tooling's gonna be just extremely good. Uh, we're investing in it now. So, nice thing about doing this, this worse version than a DSL is it is adoptable, familiar. You can write it in any language. Like, if you, if you wanna write your codec in Ruby, great, go for it. Uh, the tooling's good and only getting better. Uh, you don't have to say, well, you know, like, you know, describe it in this DSL. It's like, no, like, do exactly this thing. I'm not relying on somebody else's, I mean, I guess you are, <laughs> are depending on WebAssembly, but we all understand how that works. You're not depending on somebody's potentially buggy implementation of the uh, DSL interpreter. And it's openly extensible. If we, if we later add a bunch of stuff into the IPLD data model, that's fine. You start writing uh, new wasm blobs that handle the new things. Layout options. <coughs> so, a couple ways of doing this, right? Um, you can add a new field into the IPLD data model uh, called codec or something similar. Um, and the nice thing you get with this is all of the deep, deep linking. Uh, it stays intact. You can point to any part of this structure and be like, ah, okay, cool, this is Git, right? Done, simple. Um, you get some uh, redundancy because you have to write that SID out on all of these blocks. Um, so that's a trade-off. This is not my favorite layout, but like you, you could do this. And then anything backwards compatible, um, when it didn't have these, then you run it through, you know, you, you, you leave it up to a built-in codec. The other one, which I like because it's very upgradable um, and ha has a few other uh, advantages, even though it's te technically asymorphic, um, it adds an, an extra kind of node in here. So this is our autocodec wrapper. 
every entry point into a graph gets one of these at the top. And if you're, um, if you have, if you switch, so if you have WinFS and inside of WinFS is a Git repo, inside of that Git repo is, an, is a UNIXFS, and you need to switch between them, you can use these as the bounding boxes for those. Um, the downside is now you have to, like, you know, you have some subgraph, and let's say it's like, you know, uh, highly linked from multiple places. All of those entry points need to have this wrapper on it, and, but they could have potentially different wrappers. So if you want to interpret it in a different way, you put a pointer in and say, don't use that one, use this one. Or if you want to upgrade the WebAssembly that's getting pointed to, simple. You take the node below it and you place it underneath a different wrapper, done, you've upgraded. Oh yeah, but uh, the downside, well, upside downside, is this would break all of the existing codecs. So you wouldn't be able to run DAG JSON on this because it wouldn't know what these AC wrappers are. Right? But then you would run it with Wasm, so it wouldn't matter. But anyway, um, they should be self-describing. So yeah, there's a ABI uh, on this. So just kind of like in the last presentation, right? We have this, this nice tree of the ABI, the Wasm blob, and some other metadata. You must include a way to go from your serialization format, your uh, DAG PB, your DAG CBOR, whatever, down into a base data model that is represented in WASM, and you lay that out specifically. Then you must include one or more codecs with a default to run. So if you have some data, like say WinFS as it exists today, you can interpret that as WinFS, but you can also interpret that as UNIXFS. So you can ship all of those into the WASM module, right? And then you put in the ABI and then in the metadata, here's the things that I can do. And you may include traversal functions. So once I go into this data structure, maybe I have, a, you know, maybe it's a tree, give me the links out of the more semantically rich structure, right? Don't let the intermediate ones, only those. Right, so you can add extra traversal functions inside. Uh, these obviously have to terminate, right? Uh, we don't want these to run forever. So we need some kind of bounding on them, right? So we're gonna go from some you know, leaves on a tree through WASM and then output some kind of file. And that has to happen in finite time. And not just that, you need to have it run in some kind of a bound. Some problems here are that every machine is slightly different. So setting a timeout, like a global timeout, you know, it's gonna be very different on my M1 Mac than on a low-powered Android device. So to get consistency, and so that people know that when they ship something, that it'll actually finish, and that people can actually, like, you know, whoever is on the other side of this is actually going to be able to, to run it. Um, you can do uh, ahead of time cost dynamics, which is a form of static analysis. Um, but really, realistically, you'll use gas, and we already have experience with uh, gas-bounded WASM from the FEM work. So it's actually baked into a lot of implementations these days. So uh, who gets to encode uh, these encoders? So going back to um, how we upgrade things, how, how do we make things better? Well. Uh, this is just a tag, right? It's just, it's just data. We don't have to run that data, but we do know it's content ID, and that gives us a signal for the kind of data that's inside. Right? So we can, instead of saying the WASM, it's like, ah, you know what? I just see so much UNIXFS, and I'm running WASM all the time. I'm gonna upgrade that uh, to my native Rust code, and then execute that inside of my node instead. Right? And then time goes on, you're like, actually, people are using a lot of UNIXFS. Um, I'm going to uh, turn that into you know, hand-tuned assembly. And you can just upgrade that by reading the thing and saying, these are equivalents. I spent the time to make sure that they, are, uh, they have the same behavior. Um, and I'm gonna run it like this. I can always uh, drop back down to the WASM if I'm worried that there's a bug. Uh, I was chatting with a couple of people yesterday about uh, in-place upgrades and fixes. Uh, I actually think this is a red herring. Uh, so for, for two reasons, right? Uh, it's a deterministic codec and a 
most, well, okay, so WASM is not fully deterministic today. It's mostly deterministic, um, but uh, I believe in the next version of the spec, which they're, they're currently working on to be totally deterministic, and we can also use the deterministic subsets um, that I believe is what's used inside of FVM. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so you can just check it. You can just run it locally and be like, you know, do I get out what I, what I expected? Yes, no, right? And because it's uh, in place, whoever runs it will also get the same result. So you don't need to upgrade because you know what it's gonna do. It's not dynamic. I also think that this is at the wrong layer. If you need to upgrade something, you put a mutable pointer somewhere else, DNS link, IPNS, somewhere else, you put a different autocodec wrapper on it, you point out to it to your upgraded, um, uh, upgraded WASM, and you stick that in IPNS, right? Like, it's, it's the wrong layer for the mutability, I think. So, um, yeah, if you really wanted to do this, like if, if you had to, instead of pointing out to, um, to the WASM blob directly, yeah, you can point out to IPNS, um, but now uh, if you wanted to replace it, well, do you put in a TTL? How often do you update this? You have to do this extra lookup, you know, this extra translation, all of these things, right? What if you get a malicious update? What if you used to be able to decode this thing and now you can't? I actually think that's like, that's potentially pretty dangerous, right? Because you're starting from, you know, oh, I'm gonna like update this thing and like, you know, it's gonna get better and better and better. Uh, and then next thing you know, it's not so good anymore, right? And so now like what, do you have a flag to roll back? Like it gets complex really quickly. The thing with persistent data is you should keep it persistent, right? It's, it's static under here. It's easy to think about. You don't have to do anything. Yes, you want a mutable pointer because the world is mutable. Do that at, separate that out, do that at the top layer only. So, to wrap up. <clears throat> what I want, is something highly extensible, dynamic, concrete, by which I mean, I can just run this myself and see, did this give me the thing that I expected? Yes, okay, great, then I'll share it with people. A pure function, that's potentially optimizable so that we're not stuck with you know, this specific thing. If you wanna get native performance, you can. Thank you. Oh, and I, I should also mention, sorry, I, I think I missed a point in here somewhere along the way. Another reason that we want this, so from, from lived experience, in, with a uh, web native file system, we encoded <laughs> an entire extra part of the tree, we called the pretty tree, so that the gateway could handle it, just in UnixFS, regular. So every time we would do a write, we would walk the tree and build this latest version index, right? Which is fine, it's a little bit of extra compute, it's fine, whatever, right? But it's just mainly annoying. We had a workaround. It would have been nice to have that just be completely natively handled underneath, and getting that codec loaded in uh, into the node is not as simple as I send it to, the, sorry, into our node we could have done it, but then it wouldn't have worked on IPFS.io or on Pinata or anybody else's thing. So having this come with the codec means that we could have just shipped that in 2019 and not thought about it ever again. Anyway, questions? We may have covered some of these in the last session, so it's okay. I wonder about like the specific kind of uh, interfaces that are possible for the autocodec. I can see there being like an interface for finding new links, mm -hmm. which is like for different applications, I always say, where finding links is something you would want to do if you want to pin something, for example. Mm -hmm. um, whereas there is maybe another application that wants to actually read some data and interpret it as like a file system, mm -hmm. which is then something you could use on the gateway, which would solve our pretty tree problem. Uh, so I wonder what your thoughts are on like, is there one single multi codec or auto codec, sorry, uh, for your data or is, does there have to be like a set of multi codec, uh, auto codecs or? Whatever? So yeah, th this is part of the worst is better. It, there is no global registry for interpret this data this way. It's, I don't know what kind of data is under here, run the wasm blob and I'll find out. And I might later know, I wrote this thing here. It has the same uh, SID for the WASM section. Therefore, 
It's probably the same kind of data, right? Or at least the data is laid out the same, so I can interpret it this way. Uh, so it actually doesn't matter what's in the IPLD directly. All that really matters is how, what am I going to hydrate out of that, right? And if you want to come with a completely different codec and point at it, so you know we have the old pointer, now we have a new pointer here, that's also fine. It's just a different tree. It's, it's actually, it's, it's almost a subset, not almost, it's a subset of the stuff that we were talking about in the last presentation, where you have uh, uh, interplanetary linked invocation, wasm blob arguments, but the arguments are implicitly the tree or the, the DAG underneath it. Mm -hmm. Um, love the idea of progressive enhancement in place and because we're dorks about perf like that. Uh, trying to think ahead about that scenario and I just want to make sure I have all, everything correct. If you wanted to say drop down to your Rust code, you, or some other thing that is going to execute in a higher performance context, um, <clears throat> we would be detecting the SID itself and keying on that or do we key on the codec of the SID, uh, the, or sorry, the multi, you know, the multi codec of the SID. Right. Um, so I mean, I, I I guess you could do either. Right. But even with multi codec, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong. It seems like for, from what I've been reading and participating in some discussions over there, there's a distinction between here's how the data is laid out as JSON versus here's my application specific thing. Mm -hmm. Right, and so a lot of that's getting pushed into ADLs, and so this essentially takes both use cases. So we're not like yes, you could go into the multicodec, but uh, for a lot of use cases, many use cases, um, you want to get down into the application specific data type. Mm -hmm. Right, so probably keying off the SID would be my guess, but let's try it out. Let's find out. Yeah, and my only concern there is that you now have to sort of like you have, you fall a bit into the mutability problem following the SID changing over time and knowing when you can keep kick in your optimization. Uh, so tell me more. I'm just imagining this like, okay, cool. I hit the, I, I enter the block and I see, mm -hmm. all right, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm to use the following wasm mm -hmm. to uh, the SID, the SID points to a blob that I'm yep. supposed to use to decode this subgraph. Yep. The, so that SID is my indicator on what to key on. So ver, let's use versioning numbers for a second. That's version 1.0 of that thing later on. Oh, yeah, no no, no, no versioning Period. at, at yeah. all. It's like, you're gonna run this thing over that. That's right. the user expectation. And if you, as the maintainer of Iro, want to make that faster and do it in, uh, and have a specific one in Rust, it has to be that's it. isomorphic. Yeah. So, so you don't have to run that SID. R no, no, you no. Can run, you can load in your code, but that has to, the guarantee that you're giving the end user is that it'll behave, the output will be identical. Exactly, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, no, I'm totally clear on that and yeah. trying to just make sure that what we're effectively doing is tying that SID to a behavior. Yeah, you're, you're essentially uh, replacing everywhere you see that SID with a Rust call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, we, we thought about this a lot in, in the IPLD team over several years. Um, one thing that we kind of came to was that if you ever take the view layer and put it into the graph next to the data, you have to make sure that the read layer always has a way to overwrite it. Mm -hmm. Because eventually you just want something else to be there. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday there was a uncomp session about the IPLD scheme and what we might be able to do with pathing and stuff like that. And I very successfully was like, yeah, let's get all of our good ideas, but let's make sure that we reconcile with this. And whatever we do in terms of pathing here can always be described in a system like this so that we always have that like nice modular layer where we can layer all this stuff into it. But that would be really nice to like kind of work together between the URI pathing scheme for IPLD and this so that every time that you define something like this, we make sure that there's always a way to overwrite it in that read layer. Just to, just to clarify though, by, by say you know, to, to overwrite it, you mean to do like an upgrade on the codec? Yeah, like, like a force upgrade. Right. Often the case with like the reader of the data wasn't actually the writer of the data, <laughs> and they know that there's like a little bit of that. Yeah, totally. But so the and we, we can get into this in like way more detail uh, after as well. But so part of the idea here is let's say that that's the case. It is a 
directed acyclic graph, I should be able to map over it and just do a find replace, basically. Like every time you see this one, replace it with this, this other blob. And that essentially gives you a, if you think of it as a, a function running over the data to give you a new IPLD and then run that, right? And so, and then you can also persist the new updated one and say, update this pointer. So I, I, like, I really don't wanna do that at, a, at, at read time. I want this to be at write time and that if I know there's something wrong with it, I'm going to fix it in place as immutable data. So sometimes that's what you wanna do, yeah. especially if you are like upgrading something, then that's clear. Um, and sometimes there are other user stories too. Like if you want to take the same data and look at it through two different lenses, then maybe mm -hmm. that's actually like a read time choice. Mm -hmm. the, um, the only other thing I wanna offer is we have a vocab word for this that I wanna toss out, um, signaling problem. Mm -hmm. So like there is the nature of we must have implementations and WASM can be an implementation and there can be like replace the WASM with native code and all of these implementation selection problems. Mm -hmm. And then signaling that something must be done here at all can be a slightly different problem and I think there'll be many mechanisms for that too. So like having something in the CID is one way of solving the signaling problem. Having wrapper jumps is one way of solving the signaling problem. Mm -hmm. Useful vocab word. Awesome, thanks. So j j just to like... So e even in, in the case where you were saying you want to read it in a different, with a different codec, so this, this top AC wrapper here, why couldn't I also, let's call this bytes link directly underneath it, you know, block A. I can point to that from another wrapper. Why not, right? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, for this to work, it has to start at the very top of any region that's going to change like as a hard requirement. Yeah. Well, so, so one problem with putting the wrapper at the top is sometimes you can't like if you have dynamic types. Um, you, you can't, sorry? If you have dynamic types. Uh, like you might have something that's dynamically typed uh, internally and you don't know the code you're gonna need there. Or sorry, like you, you have a list of things that have different code. Uh, does that make sense? Like that means? Uh, so, sorry. Uh, so walk me through it much more slowly. Sorry. So like like um, ideally at the top you would say like for this DAG like use yeah. these these types. Yes. But sometimes you might be in the middle and you need to switch between different types. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So the, so yeah the, the idea mm -hmm. is at each of these AC wrappers they're different kind of node. Mm -hmm. As you're so in the codec you're going to start walking down yeah. the graph and you hit one of these and you decide am I going to respect this or not? Am I going to switch? And you okay. can write the code that does this, this, that respects switching or not. And at write time, you can make that decision. Okay. Right. The, the, these can be these can be specific specific to one DAG and never used again because it's wasm. Okay, I'll have to read up on this more. Okay. So it like the, the, yeah, I, I think from talking to a few people, right? It's not that we have this is a schema that mm -hmm. we're going to interpret this way, and then we have a registry. It's Run this exact wasm yes. over this exact thing, and the, the if you think about and it, that would give us the yeah the bytes. Yeah, if you think about okay. it in types, it's IPLD arrow x what you know what, whatever you want back out bytes yes. from the perspective of the the machine, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, the the other side is like um, like I I do kind of agree on the read side thing. The problem is like. Quite often, you will have some immutable thing you don't want it to change ever. You don't want somebody to be able to control it with a key. So that's why it is important we have able to have you read overrides. The the saving grace here is like it doesn't um, like when I produce the data. Uh, it, sorry, it's, it's hard to exercise like a security vulnerability because like when I make something, mm -hmm. I'm already locking in that data and that code. Mm -hmm. uh, so like chances are like if someone wants to like exploit something, they would need to provide new data. But if the data is already content addressed, they can't. Uh, so you actually you don't always need to upgrade this. It's only if you find a bug and you really, really want to replace something because like it turns out someone produced a bunch of data that we just had like was bad, it didn't, didn't work in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that can be fixed read side. The other thing I wanted to note was uh, specifically in the signaling, we've talked a lot about, so that was part of my presentation as well, about having like these fat pointers. Um, like this wrapper way is the other way of doing it, but one way is literally just like two pointers together um, uh, where you start at the top and then you can sort of make your type tree and your data tree. Um, if that makes sense. Right. So in, in that case, you have a, some DSL that describes what's inside? Uh, you no, know, like literally the fat pointer is like, like a CID, a special type of CID that has two CIDs inside where one points to code and one points to, to the data tree. 
so that we can uh, kind of glue code onto data. That, 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 that's what this is. Yeah, but that's a spe yes, but this puts it in the CID itself. They say the AC wrapper becomes just the place to uh, put that data yeah. on. Yeah. Oh, so like. It makes it like this. No. 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 Go, go, go back one. So take take the the AC wrapper and lift yeah. it into the make it a link and yeah. lift it into the bytes link, link above. Right. Yeah. That's. Well, so this one is every block. But you mean just to have it at the, the edge, basically, of the, the graph. The pointer coming into this, the pointer coming into this would include the, the uh, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. So if you can treat the CAD as a pointer coming into the subject, they're saying take that CAD and add another pointer into that same CAD. Sure. So it's like a CAD that like, yeah. has additional data that points to the WASM. So, so you would have that, that purple arrow and the pink arrow together from one point. Right, so you take the, the tuples that are inside the links and you make them triples. No, there's a tuples. What Name, well, Sid, Kodak. Well, we two CIDs, but CIDs already have like, multiple things in the data structure. Well, it's tuples. No, so, so links have, have names in CIDs. My point yeah. is like, in the CID itself, you make that two pieces, where one piece is the code. Yeah, we're basically. Oh, yeah. so your, your CID is like two CIDs today. Yes, or like you have okay. like, like one links okay. to the code. One, the nice thing about this means like, I, I could take your link and I can replace the code. Yeah. And I also don't have small objects. Now, if you're willing to deal with small objects, yeah, you just have the intermediate blocks and you're fine. I, I like it. Faster, yeah. Probably, yes. And you end up with smaller links to 512 bits is a lot. Yeah. And you, you can also uh, do stuff like when you have mutable references, you can put the mutable yeah. pointer and the mutable state in. You can like always go in back and resolve that. It solves for a bunch of things. Yeah. But the upside of the double CID is in the Brooke, in that one, in this case? Yeah, your CID of AC wrapper is always going to change because it contains byte link. And so you have to, you can't lazily look at AC wrapper and go, ah, that's going to be. Well, you have to rehash that. You do. Yeah. Yes. The, the, yeah, the problem with that pointer is that there's a lot of places where you want to put in a link, and it's too, the, the link is, length is not big enough to, to allow two very large objects. Yes, that is, that is a big problem there. Yeah, internally inside the data structure, you're usually fine because, like, that's what I was saying. That's what we're trying to get across with dynamic versus static, uh, where like sometimes you'll have a link and you'll statically know like the code you want to apply there, mm -hmm. but that can actually be applied by the parent code. So like when you decode the object, you can sort of like explode that out. When you have dynamic pointers, that's when you need to do the, the AC wrapper stuff. So one, but one of the tricks to that is that you literally have a codec for CIDB2 in the CIDB1 table, so that you can just hash it as a block. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. That's that's this basically. That's the easy wrapper. Yeah. Probably. But but I think in that case, like just make it work with objects and then solve inline. Well, because we we can solve inlining in a compiler step. Yeah. Like you you can still treat it as separate objects, not have to do it in the CAD, and then be able to point to objects, then inline all of these things that you're generating. I I like the idea of inlining multiple different options of interpreting the data because you may have like a binary plot that you want to like as text or as like raw binary and like that's two different like read views. Uh, and we're gonna serialize that to the stack or are we gonna leave that? Well it's just like uh, pointing to the work or something. Yeah. One just multiple points. One thing that's covered in a lot of discussions is like definitely the layer. Uh, so like like the problem is like the uh, IPLD is complicated and confusing for a lot of people because it has a lot of stuff uh, where like but like at the bottom like it is you have an object and you get a set of links the next layer up is you have an object and you get a set of name links that you can resolve the next layer up is it goes to a data model so like like if you create these kinds of layers and you can let people opt into what they need and then you can at a minimum get like mm -hmm. bit swap and graph sync over like just the links. Yeah, but so like you know, uh, doing it with uh, in the link or with the wrapper. I mean, as they sound isomorphic, it's just a, maybe a more efficient way to lay it out. Happy with that. Amazing. <laughs> it just depends on, on your use case. The reason we talk about that a lot is like there are two two things to help there. Like one, if you want to swap things out really fast. Yeah. Uh, and two, like small blocks can be problematic for storage, retrieval, all that kind of stuff. If you get that fixed, the thing is like, honestly, that's a transport issue that we're leaking into the data layer, which we shouldn't. Um, uh, so ideally, yeah. we would fix the transports. And just, <laughs> but it's like, the problem is like, okay, what if I advertise that small little block? Now I have to advertise all these additional blocks, which is like, yeah. not great. Yeah, well, I mean, you could also, you know, for changing IPLD, really, in this version, or, well, less the other version. Yours is actually probably more like transport layer compatible. 
right? Than this, where there's differences in the tree, right? But you could lay this out where um, we know that on disk, or I mean, actually everywhere, we're just going to inline the wasm into the wrapper, and now it's larger, right? Like, we, we have options for that too. It's just, yeah, where, where exactly you put it. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy either way. Those both sound great. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, I actually, really quickly, one other thing. When you have this broken out like this, is yes, you need to have at, at minimum these things. You can stick whatever you want in there. So let's say that I had encrypted data and I had extra fields that I need to pass in, like, I don't know, a key. I can do that. That would be amazing. So anyway, yeah, that's all. Thanks.